by Kali Geva, who had suffered a terrible accident, was working with her head down, avoiding people's eyes. Suddenly, an inappropriately loud laugh disrupted the somber atmosphere of the office. Look at that battered face, you're like a monster. Monsters shouldn't come to the office, haha. -ha. The unreserved loud voice of our boss, Kevin, struck her heart like a sharp arrow. Ava, who had been holding on until the last moment, finally couldn't hold back and started to shake her shoulders slightly. The moment I saw a tear drop from her face, which she covered with her hands, my head heated up in anger. I'm fed up with losing the smiles of those I care about. With that thought, I began to plan a meeting with a certain person. My name is Tyler. I'm a 35-year-old ordinary office worker. My family runs a hospital, and I was given everything I needed since I was young. My parents allowed me to freely pursue any hobbies or interests I had, and provided a good environment for my education. However, I had no outstanding talents and realized by the time I entered elementary school that I had no particular skills. In contrast to me, my younger brother, two years my junior, Kyle, quickly achieved notable results. Kyle, with intelligence much like our father's, continued to deliver results one after the other, quickly becoming the focus of our father's expectations. But I didn't resent that. Instead, I was thankful that I could live freely without any constraints. However, this relationship crumbled fragilely during middle school. While I aimlessly attended a local middle school, Kyle was accepted into a prestigious middle school in New York. Seeing Kyle aiming for medical school to follow in our father's footsteps, I started to feel a sense of alienation. My father also seemed to pay attention only to Kyle, as if I didn't exist. Having lost all confidence, I became unable to attend school and started to shut myself in my room. The one who continued to love me unchanged was my mother. You have your own strengths, don't worry. There are so many fun things in the world, you don't have to rush. My mother was an optimist and always reassured me that it's okay. Hearing her words somehow eased my anxiety and I felt that I had value as I was. Thanks to her, I managed to graduate from middle school and went on to a local high school. I had been playing games as a hobby and on a whim, I decided to create my own game which was unexpectedly well-received when I presented it at the school festival. Seeing me interact with classmates through my game, my mother was very pleased. I'm glad you found something you're passionate about. I still clearly remember her smiling face when she said that. It was soon after that when my mother was diagnosed with a serious illness. The once cheerful mother grew thinner and lost her energy day by day. The treatment started, but it was only enough to slow the progression of the illness, not cure it. The medication made her lose a lot of weight, and she lost her hair. Eventually, she couldn't live at home anymore and spent her days lying in her hospital bed. Just before she passed away, she muttered with a sad face, Why me? I still want to live. The sight of my grieving mother was so painful that I wanted to look away and it's deeply etched in my memory. Afterward, I became a working adult and joined a newly established game company. Determined not to disappoint my mother in heaven, I dedicated myself to work every day. Good morning, you're looking down again, cheer up. The one who greeted me energetically was my colleague Ava. She was cheerful and friendly to everyone, brightening the atmosphere at work. Not only was her mood uplifting, but she was also highly skilled, having contributed to several hit projects as a programmer. Talented, action-oriented, and beautiful, Ava was indeed a perfect woman. She never got carried away by her abilities and always approached her work with seriousness, which I deeply respected. Ava, with her eyes sparkling, approached me just as I arrived at work. Hey, I heard we're getting a new department head. I wonder what kind of person they'll be. Ah, that's right, starting today. The new department head, 
an elite graduate from a prestigious university, was specially recruited from another company by our upper management. We were initially hopeful about the new department head's arrival, but within a month, we were fed up. The department head, named Kevin, was in his prime working years in his 40s. However, he seemed quite confident in himself and never tried to hide his attitude that he was superior in any situation. I'm the reason this company's performance improved. Stop complaining and just follow the orders. With an annoyingly loud voice and a pompous attitude, he ordered his subordinates around. Because of Kevin's habit of asserting his superiority at every opportunity, the previously relaxed atmosphere of our workplace gradually became tense and uncomfortable. Kevin, without considering the situation on the ground, kept bringing in more work. As a result, the employees were forced to work tirelessly, ending up with daily overtime. Despite this, since the numbers showed an increase in the department's sales, the upper management praised Kevin. This led to a vicious cycle where Kevin's attitude became even more arrogant, and his unreasonable demands on his subordinates continued unabated. It would have been tolerable if he was competent, but... When Kevin came along with me to meet a client, insisting on his superiority even there, it ended terribly. During the final discussions with the client, Kevin interjected. What? You can't even handle this level of work and outsource it to us. Kevin, as usual, looked down on the client with his condescending attitude. The moment my face turned pale and the client became furious, announcing the deal was off, happened simultaneously. Years of trust I had built with the client were destroyed by a single comment from Kevin. How could you do this? This client was supposed to work with us for the next 10 years. I protested to Kevin when we got back, but he nonchalantly retorted. What's the point of any plan if it doesn't make money? It's a waste of time talking to such a small client. Kevin seemed completely unconcerned about the broken deal being his fault. The company's profit comes first. This is the problem with you. I've been working hard to earn that client's trust. You've made all that effort go to waste because of your actions, Kevin. Kevin glared at me menacingly as I protested impulsively. If you're going against me, you better be prepared. I can always complain about your work attitude to the upper management. Kevin's veiled threat of punishment made me bite my lip and fall silent. After my mother's death, my performance at the company was all that supported me, having never been recognized by anyone else. Yet, the frustration only grew having to work under such an irresponsible boss. I wanted nothing to do with him anymore, but the pain of having to see his face every day at work was unbearable. Since then, I've been careful to avoid working with Kevin as much as possible, but he kept causing trouble for other subordinates as well. He wouldn't bother to learn document preparation or administrative procedures, saying, such simple tasks should be done by subordinates and dumped everything on us. At times, he would even take documents without asking, including taking documents containing sensitive personal information to another company. It nearly turned into a major crisis, but Ava, who was with him at the time, apologized profusely. Thanks to her, this situation didn't escalate, and it was resolved within our department. But it could have easily become an emergency that threatened the company's existence. Yet, Kevin continued his defiant attitude without admitting any fault. Preparing easy-to-understand materials for the supervisor is the subordinate's job. It was almost a big crisis because of your lack of attentiveness. Ava was the first to lose patience with Kevin's inapologetic behavior. On the day of the personal information incident, Ava invited me out for drinks. She, too had been troubled by Kevin's terrible attitude on a regular basis. It's not just today. I went to a meeting with him before, and he started lecturing the client arrogantly, causing a lot of trouble. I thought so. It's bad enough with people inside the company, but causing trouble for our clients is too much. So, Ava and I ended up venting to each other, 
but there was nothing we could do about it. I was just hoping Kevin would be transferred out as soon as possible, but Ava had other plans. From the next day, Ava began to firmly say no to Kevin. That day, as Kevin was criticizing the work of his subordinates as usual without providing any concrete suggestions for improvement, Ava spoke up. If you're so confident, please proceed with the work without relying on us. We, in turn, will not involve Kevin at all. Her statement echoed the sentiments of the entire workplace. Her argument was so convincing that Kevin couldn't refute it, no matter how much he tried afterward. Seeing this, spontaneous applause broke out from the employees in the department. Everyone was fed up with Kevin's tyranny. Completely isolated, Kevin glared at us in silence, his face flushed with anger. While everyone was expressing their gratitude to Ava, Kevin shot her a furious look. After being humiliated in front of everyone, Kevin began to harbor a grudge against Ava from that day on. You will see, you've made a fool of me like this, I'll get back at you someday. Muttering complaints, Kevin returned to his desk. Following that day, Kevin became subdued, allowing the employees to carry out their daily work smoothly. Everyone was thankful to Ava for speaking up so clearly. Especially Henry, the manager caught between Kevin and his subordinates, was so moved that he tearfully thanked Ava. We all hoped for a return to a peaceful workplace. But then, shocking news was brought to the workplace. Ava had been involved in a serious accident. She was out on a visit with Kevin by car when they unfortunately got into an accident. Ava was unconscious when taken to the hospital and had to be admitted. Kevin, on the other hand, had no serious injuries and showed up to work the next day as if nothing had happened. It was all because of her poor driving that I had such a terrible experience. She should work on her driving skills before meddling in other people's work. Ava is seriously injured and hospitalized. Isn't it cruel to speak like that? I couldn't help but retort to his sharp words. But Kevin just smirked with a chilling smile. A sudden feeling of unease washed over me. Anyway, when Ava comes back, please don't say anything that could upset her. All right, we'll see if she can come back here after she's discharged. His ambiguous statement made me frown. Kevin left with a creepy smile, saying no more. The reason for Kevin's behavior became clear two months later when Ava was discharged from the hospital. Her condition upon returning to work was dire. Ava, ah, this, I'm sorry for showing you something so unsightly, with these scars remaining. Speaking in a low voice, Ava then headed to her desk, her head bowed. The sight of her, so different from the bright and smiling person who used to greet me, made me feel melancholy. Her face was still healing, covered in bandages, with more than half concealed. The visible skin was discolored from the injuries, and her muscles were contorted, distorting her mouth. Her once smooth and beautifully shaped face, like a boiled egg, was now unrecognizably distorted. I couldn't find the words to comfort Ava, who quietly kept her head down. Although I knew about the serious accident, I wasn't aware of the extent of the injuries to her face. Ava worked with her head down, making sure no one could see her face. Sensing the situation, the colleagues remained silent, not attempting to start a conversation. But the somber office atmosphere was suddenly shattered by Kevin's inappropriate laughter. With a face like that, all bumpy, you look like a monster. Monsters shouldn't come to the office. Kevin's loud and insensitive remark made everyone stiffen. Naturally, Ava heard it too, and his words shattered her heart like a sharp arrow. Ava, who had been holding back until the last moment, started to shake her shoulders finally, unable to contain her emotions any longer. The moment I saw a tear drop from her face, which she covered with her hands, my head heated up with anger. Having worked with her for many years, I had never seen the always smiling Ava cry. Her saddened appearance overlapped with the image of my mother before she passed away. 
My mother also had a disfigured face and cried every day. I was fed up with losing the smiles of loved ones. When I noticed her tears, such feelings stormed through my mind. I immediately stood up, shielding Ava from behind. Then, I raised my voice in anger at Kevin, who was still laughing thoughtlessly. Kevin, that's way out of line, as a supervisor. No, as a person, this is unacceptable. Apologize right now. What? I haven't done anything that needs apologizing for. Are you accusing me of something too? If you don't like having me as your supervisor, work somewhere else. Saying this, Kevin left the room while making a call somewhere. I considered going after him but realized I had more important things to attend to. Turning back, I saw Eva quietly shedding tears, her head bowed in sadness. I couldn't let her be saddened like my mother was. Taking her hand firmly in mine, I spoke with sincerity. Don't worry about a thing, I'll always be here for you, so there's no need to worry. Just as my mother used to encourage me, I spoke gently and gave her a reassuring smile. Working together at this company, Ava always greeted me with a radiant smile. Now was the time to return the favor, I thought, as I gently potted her back with encouragement. Soon after, I was called in by the upper management. I was subjected to a stern questioning. It was about the incident where Kevin took documents containing personal information to another company. Somehow, the story had been twisted to suggest that it was not Kevin but I who had made the mistake, and the management was grilling me. I had no recollection of such an event and desperately tried to explain, but no one would listen. Before I knew it, my transfer to a rural area was decided. All this happened just a few hours after my confrontation with Kevin. It was too well executed to be coincidental, and later, an unbelievable truth came to light. Kevin had apparently been doing this kind of thing repeatedly in the past. Whenever he made a mistake, he would take his time to set up a subordinate to take the fall. He would fabricate all the evidence and then suddenly pin the blame on a subordinate, rushing the upper management's decision to transfer or fire them before they could respond. This way, the blame for the mistake fell on an unsuspecting employee. Kevin planned to continue acting as a supervisor in the workplace, escaping any blame. The thought of being transferred because of someone else's mistake was unbearable. As I was fuming over what to do, I was called in by Nathan, who used to be my supervisor. Even if it was Kevin's suggestion, it's impossible for Tyler to do such a thing, but Kevin won't be satisfied with this situation as it is. Nathan said, it's frustrating, but we're currently devising a plan against Kevin. I'm sorry, but could you pretend to be transferred for a while? Nathan then suggested I take some paid leave. Having focused on work all this time, I had about three weeks of vacation accumulated. Since Ava's accident, I had been working nonstop to fill the gap left by such a capable employee. Encouraged by Nathan's words to think of it as an extended break, I accepted the proposal. As I was about to leave the company, Nathan quietly informed me of something else. He mentioned contacting a certain individual. It was Harrison, the chairman of the group of companies overseeing ours. Chairman Harrison was often traveling around the world and rarely had the chance to return to America. But he was scheduled to come back to America soon and Nathan would reach out to him on my behalf. Grateful for Nathan's arrangements, I decided to wait for the day I would meet Chairman Harrison. The first person I contacted that day was Kyle, now a respectable doctor and having taken over our father's hospital, I had great respect for Kyle. But it had been a while since we last spoke on the phone, so I was nervous as I listened to the ringing tone. Tyler, it's rare for you to call me. Hearing the familiar voice that hadn't changed over the years, I felt the tension in my shoulders ease. I pleaded with Kyle for help, sharing with him Mavis' situation. I told him about the injuries she sustained in the accident and my desire to heal the scars on her face as much as possible. 
After pondering for a while, Kyle promised to do everything within his power to help. I'd like to see her condition myself. It might be busy, but can you come to our hospital? I told Kyle, we'd come right away, and hung up. Ironically, thanks to Kevin, I had three weeks of paid leave and was ready to move at any time. I immediately contacted Ava and rushed to Kyle's hospital. I appreciate the thought, but are you sure they can treat me? The doctor I saw said it would be difficult without a highly skilled physician. Ava looked at me with a mix of hope and uncertainty. Besides, they said the good doctors are so popular that I couldn't get an appointment for the next two years. No problem, I'm sure it will be fine. The doctor she mentioned was probably Kyle. Kyle is a skilled plastic surgeon who has treated thousands of cases of scars, burns, and injuries. As the scars and indentations are carefully treated, the patient's expressions brighten. Kyle once said that seeing their smiles is the greatest reward of all. Supporting a worried Ava, we hurried to the hospital where Kyle was waiting. In the consultation room, Kyle carefully examined Ava's facial injuries and nodded confidently. It's okay, there's no damage to the bones, and the damaged nerves around the mouth can be carefully repaired with surgical suturing. Let's schedule you for surgery. Encouraged by his confident words, Ava looked up in surprise. Straightening her back with the vivacity she had before the injury, she finally showed a smile. Once the hospital stay and surgery were scheduled, we discussed the plans on our taxi ride home. I thought I'd have to live with this face forever, but the thought of being able to return to how I was before makes me so happy. Seeing Ava's spirits lifted, I too felt relieved. Thanks to Kyle, she was able to look forward again. I'll definitely get back at Kevin once I'm healed. I won't forgive him. I thought her anger was due to his comments at the office, but as she elaborated, I was horrified. It wasn't just what he said that was awful, but the cause of the accident. He was road raging. He braked suddenly and swerved lanes just because he didn't like the car behind us. Ava began to recount the situation at the time of the accident, still seething with anger. Although Kevin claimed Ava was driving that day, it turned out he insisted on driving himself. But his driving skills were poor, and Ava, sitting in the passenger seat, was nervous. At one point, Kevin sneezed and accidentally hit the brakes. The sudden braking during the drive led to the car behind them honking lightly. However, Kevin, mistaking it for provocation, became furious. He started braking abruptly and swerving to obstruct the lane change of the car behind, thinking of retaliating. Ava tried to calm Kevin down and offered to drive instead, but his pride wouldn't allow him to stop his reckless driving, saying he was just teaching a rude person a lesson. As a result, distracted by the car behind, Kevin caused an accident but covered up the fact that he was driving during the investigation. Just as he always did at work, he pinned a blame on his subordinate Ava. Upon hearing that, I acted quickly. I checked the dash cam footage from the company car involved in the accident to find the relevant footage. With all preparations complete, I awaited the day of reckoning, feeling relieved. Meanwhile, with Ava and me absent from the company, Kevin was visibly in a better mood. If you defy me, you'll end up like Tyler and Ava, unable to stay in the company, he threatened, harassing any employee he disliked. As reports of his behavior reached me, my three-week paid leave came to an end, and it was time to return to work. Executive Nathan called me in and asked me to wait in a room at the company. Chairman Harrison, who had just returned from an overseas inspection, was visiting the company, causing a stir since the morning. Kevin, on the other hand, was eager to meet Chairman Harrison and promote himself, pacing near the office. When Chairman Harrison arrived, he began chatting with Nathan. Kevin, having no business there, hovered nearby, desperate for tension. After about 10 minutes of conversation, Chairman Harrison turned to Kevin with a surprised expression as if he had just noticed him. Ah, so you're the famous Kevin I've heard about. 
an elite graduate from a prestigious university, I hear. I've been told your department has seen a significant improvement in performance. Thank you very much. Even Kevin, as self-centered as he is, seemed unable to behave recklessly in front of the chairman of the group company. If an employee as capable as you can get along well with that person, I'm sure you'll achieve great results together. After all, that person is one of the most promising talents in our company. That person, who might that be? Ignoring a puzzled Kevin, Chairman Harrison intentionally looked around with an exaggerated gaze. Then, his expression grew stern as he pressed on. It seems my grandchild is nowhere to be seen here. Your grandchild works at this company. Kevin, not knowing who he was referring to, started to sweat and panic. Chairman Harrison lowered his voice and interrogated him. I hope no one has driven my grandchild out of the company. At the menacing tone of his voice, Kevin was trembling and sweating profusely. That's when I, who had been waiting in the next room, made my appearance. Tyler, ignoring Kevin, who was staring at me in shock, I turned to Nathan. Thank you for the three-week break. It was very refreshing. I'm glad you could rest. Keep up the hard work. At that point, Kevin seemed to realize something as he stared intently at me. Then Chairman Harrison approached me, starting a cheerful conversation. I thought you might have been transferred out since you were gone. As if I could be transferred from a subsidiary company owned by my grandfather. Saying that, I slowly turned to look at Kevin. He must have been quite taken aback by the unexpected turn of events. His eyes were wide open, and his mouth was moving silently. In fact, this group company founded by my grandfather, from the hospital where my father and Kyle worked to the management of my game company, operates in a wide range of fields. However, I had joined this company without using my family's connections, so only the president and Nathan knew this fact. After a while, Kevin coughed a few times and then started talking to me in a strangely familiar tone, as if hearing this for the first time. I always thought Tyler was an exceptional employee, truly worthy of being Chairman Harrison's grandson. Enough with the lies, I've heard all about you from my grandson. At Chairman Harrison's words, Kevin visibly jumped. Staring at me as if in disbelief, I gave him a reassuring smile. Kevin began to tremble as Chairman Harrison continued in a voice barely containing his anger. I've received a detailed report from my grandson about your usual work attitude. Harassing my grandson, treating other employees terribly, I cannot forgive any of it. Chairman Harrison's decisive words left Kevin opening and closing his mouth in a futile attempt at excuses. But no sound came out as he faced the chairman's intense gaze. Moreover, you caused an accident and then fled, pushing the blame onto a subordinate. Leave this company immediately. At the loudness of Chairman Harrison's voice, Kevin must have realized that everything was exposed. Unable to make his usual excuses, he let out a pitiful cry and staggered out of the company. Afterwards, the company submitted the dash cam footage to the police. In fact, our company's dash cams were the type that recorded not only the front and rear of the vehicle, but also the interior. The footage clearly showed Kevin's reckless driving at the time of the accident. This became irrefutable evidence, revealing that Kevin was indeed driving. Kevin, having caused the accident, had the paramedics take Ava away first. Then he falsely reported to the police that the severely injured Ava was the one driving. Normally, such a thing would be difficult to cover up, but it turns out Kevin's uncle holds a significant position within the police force and tried to sweep it under the rug. Apparently, his uncle also found it inconvenient to have a relative involved in a scandal, and Kevin had been let off for minor offenses like parking violations in the past. He must have thought he could hide this accident as well. Kevin's cowardice in engaging in reckless driving and then trying to pin the blame on Ava outraged the employees anew. Ava, unaware of these details, was quite shocked to learn the truth. Ava, 
preoccupied with her facial scars, never dreamed she would be made responsible for the accident. It was all a part of Kevin's despicable scheme to evade responsibility. As a result, Kevin was arrested by the police. With evidence against him and his attempt at malicious evidence tampering, he was expected to face severe punishment. The last time I saw him, Kevin had lost the confidence he once had and looked gaunt and pale, a shadow of his former self. I hope he spends the rest of his life facing up to the crimes he committed and doing his best to make amends. Afterwards, I visited Ava post-surgery to support her through her recovery. Though she may not have returned completely to her former self, she now smiles at me without hiding her face. Her bright expression was just like the Ava I knew before. I've never been more grateful to have a skilled plastic surgeon as a brother. Furthermore, Ava's surgery led me to reconnect with my family, from whom I had been estranged. To my surprise, my father and Kyle had purchased the games I was involved in. Your games are really interesting, Kyle said, the skilled plastic surgeon engrossed in my creation, which brought a laugh to my lips. Feeling previously alienated, I now realized my family had always been waiting for me, despite my avoidance. This connection was all thanks to Ava. Now, Ava's beauty has fully returned to her face. Tyler, you are my savior. Thank you so much. I just did what anyone would do. It was Kyle who healed you. Faced with Ava's direct gaze, I felt embarrassed. That's not true. You were the one who reached out to me when I was hurt and crying. Ava's smiling face warmed my heart. This time, I was able to protect the smile of someone important to me. Thank you, she said, extending her hand, which I gladly took. As we looked into each other's eyes, we both smiled, our cheeks relaxing in unison.